So thanks a lot, uh, Jesper, for the very nice introduction. Do you hear me, uh, guys, on the other side? Good. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so welcome. Uh, thanks a lot uh, for introducing me, and thanks uh, for in uh, for inviting me here. I'm. Uh, it's it's really pleasant to to meet uh, all people in person and also remotely, uh, and to have this opportunity to talk about uh, the field of my interest, farm threat complexity. So as Jesper said, uh, this uh, uh, semester program has uh, different facets uh, of computer optimization. Uh, I do represent here probably the parameterized facets. Uh, and uh, yeah, so this is going to be sort of a crash course in, in foreign press complexity. I know that people in this room and also uh, definitely behind uh, uh, on the other side are definitely a very diverse crowd in terms of uh, expertise and interests. Uh, so I do not uh, assume that we know anything about foreign press complexity. I will start from scratch, but I will try to go pretty uh, maybe not quickly, but uh, uh, with a uh, reasonable pace towards topics that are more into uh, more aligned with uh, with what is this uh, program about, namely computer optimization. So more or less, out of this lecture, half will be a crash course in basics of parameter complexity, and then uh, I will try to put in some additional material uh, on the other half. Uh, where uh, it will be more, more advanced and more towards like LP-based methods and so on. And on Friday, we will have uh, the last uh, lecture will be about specifically a uh, parameterized complexity of integer linear programming and basic methods uh, that can be done. Good, Good so let's start. Uh, so uh, the first lecture of, uh, about parameterized algorithm will be about uh, the, the most basic uh, um, technique there, namely branch. But first, what parameterized complexity is, is really about. Uh, so the main idea, like the, the let's say motivation a speech about parameter complexity is that in standard uh, complexity theory, we are given some instance I of my problem. Uh, yeah, and we usually measure the complexity of an algorithm uh, solving this problem in, uh, in N, which is the total size of the instance, say bit size of the instance. And there's a classic complexity. But once you start doing algorithms, uh, you immediately realize that you have different combinatorial problems, and many, many times uh, a combinatorial problem that, uh, that, that you work with has uh, some specific parameters that you also want to include in this measurement of, say, time complexity. For instance, in Steiner tree, the number of terminals is something natural, yes? In some uh, geometric problems, maybe the dimension of the space you're working with. Yes, uh, uh, maybe the solution size, so we will see it in a moment. So there are some auxiliary measures that also you can take into account when measuring the, the complexity of an algorithm. And this we call parameters. So for example, uh, in parameterized complexity, a usual instance that we work with is com comprised of the instance itself and some parameter, which is sort of meant to reflect the, the complexity, the, the hardness of the instance. It can be one parameter. It can be also a vector of parameters if you are interested in several uh, auxiliary measures. Yeah? So of course, this is not a breakthrough idea to measure the running time in, uh, in, in several uh, parameters. But the breakthrough idea is that you can actually systematically uh, define uh, what does it mean and systematically investigate what happens here. And you can, um, you can construct a sound complexity theory that explains when you can uh, see certain parameters algorithm and when uh, you, shouldn't, uh, you shouldn't expect ones. And there is also a specific toolbox for such parameters algorithm. And this toolbox we are going to explore during this. Yeah, so this is the basic pitch talk. So let's jump into some example to make things uh, more concrete. So the basic example that we always uh, start with probably is vertex jump. Yeah, so this is a basic question. Yes, on the input, you've got a graph G and an integer K. And the question you are asking in your problem is, is there a vertex cover set X of vertices? of size at most k, such that every edge has endpoint in x. Yeah. So I want to cover all the edges. Therefore, 
for instance, if I drew a small graph like that, I would probably pick this vertex. Uh, I need to cover this edge, this vertex. I still need to cover this edge. So this would be a vertex covering size. Yeah, so we here have a problem. The input is a graph. Yes, and there's also this auxiliary parameter, okay, that I can use to start to measure us. So let's make some uh, easy uh, parameterized algorithm for this problem. So the algorithm would work as follows. So first of all, if there is no edge, then well, I just already covered all the edges because there is none. So I will write TA because I just solved the instance. Yes, I can terminate that. Okay, if there is still some edge, but the budget is zero, I cannot take any, then I can safely answer no, yeah, because I cannot cover all the edges. Yes, otherwise I still have some budget and there is some edge. So let me pick some edge UV. And then when I have an edge here, I see that I need to pick either the left hand point or the right hand point, my solution, yeah, because this edge needs to be covered. So branch into two sub instances in one remove U and decrease budget by one, and then the other remove V and decrease budget by one. Yeah, so this is a basic algorithm that, uh, that solves the problem. Um, so let's analyze the running time of this algorithm. So this is recursion, yeah, branch into two subcases. And the idea is that if you start with the initial instance, you branch into two sub instances and your parameter dropped and then you branch further and so on. So in total, this whole recursion tree has branching two and depth K. So it has total size at most two to the K. Yeah. In every node of this recursion, I'm just trying to find some edge. So let's say that we are doing it in linear time. So the total running time is two to the K times linear in N, maybe with some O notation around. Yeah, so this is a basic algorithm that solves the, uh, the vertex cover problem. And you see that the running time is exponential, but this exponential factor is really confined uh, to the parameter K. If the parameter K is small, then definitely uh, your algorithm will run. Fast. But of course, if K is large, then you will not be uh, so fast. So running time of this form is called in parameter as complexity, fixed parameter tractable or just FPT. And this kind of running, this kind of uh, algorithm is that is what we are really after in parameterized complexity. So formally, the definition is that a parameterized problem, uh, problem is FPT if there is an algorithm solving it in time. So what kind of time would it be abstractly? Some function of the parameter times some fixed polynomial. Yeah. We usually expect this to be right. We expect this to be a universal constant. In this case, it would be one uh, because, well, the encoding of the graph is here. Yes, and we usually expect F to be computable. Not just for um, making the, the whole theory somehow well behaved. Um, yeah, so this is a, this is a, the basic notion of, of form trust complexity and those FPT algorithms are the ones that we are that we are looking for. Yeah. So this is to say problem is linear time solvable for every fixed k. This is how you think about it. Good. So this was example number one, vertex cover. So we have now shown that the vertex cover problem is fixed parameter tractable. So let's see another example of a problem where that behaves somewhat differently, namely the click problem. Yeah, so again, the input is a graph G and a parameter K. And the question is, are there 
their K pairwise adjacent vertices. Yep. Yes. Is there any question? Yeah, can I ask a question? Can I ask? Do you hear me? Yes. Why is it important that this F is uh, computable? Um, you could not assume that, but then when you start to build the complexity theory around parameterized problems, you would uh, encounter technical problems, simply. So sometimes you want this function to be computable in order to sort of uh, measure what will be the running time of an algorithm if you, if you apply it to this, and just for the technical uh, um, uh, convenience, uh, this is usually assumed. So this is for complexity theoretical purposes. Yeah. But I'm, you could I'm also working. work with, uh, without this assumption, and you could also work with a non-uniform version of that. that uh, for every fixed k, you have a linear time algorithm, for instance. But isn't it automatically computable? I mean, if you, you just let the algorithm run, and you find an upper bound, and the upper no, bound would no. still be fine. No, you can make an algorithm whose running time uh, you know a priori that uh, it will always finish, but you do not have a computable upper bound. Computable upper bound. There are algorithms like that coming from, say, graph minors theory. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So any algorithm, uh, any arguments using uh, well quasi ordering uh, would typically uh, uh, diverge into this kind of problems. Okay, but coming back to the click problem, yes. Uh, the, this is a usual problem in, in complexity theory where you want to find k pairwise uh, adjacent vertices in a graph. And the brute force algorithm. Yeah, well, it is order of n to the k. You just check all the k tables. Yes. So observe that this is also like polynomial for every fixed k. Yes. But here the, the exponent goes up with k. Yes, and there we assume that it does not. So algorithm of this type, so the runtime would be uh, some function of k times n to some other function of k. These are called xp, or in, in plain words, slice-wise polynomial. Yes, so for every fixed k, the running time is polynomial. And of course, this running time is less desired than the FPT one. Yeah. So now the question is, could you solve the click problem in fixed parameter uh, uh, time? And the conjecture is that no. So essentially the base of this complexity theory is a hierarchy of parameterized classes, of classes of parameterized problems. Uh, let me now write this theory, this, 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 uh, um, this process. So on the bottom, we have problems that are fixed parameter tractable. Then you have a hierarchy W1, W2, and so on and so on. I will just write for reference some classes, WP, then you've got AW star, and then you've got uh, XP, yeah? And the click problem is complete for the level W1, yes? So then uh, the click problem is not fixed parameter tractable unless FPT is equal to W. Yeah. And this is the assumption that, uh, that is uh, typically used. So the assumption is that FPT is not equal to W1. So not all problems in, uh, in, uh, in W1 can be solved in FPT team time. And in particular, this assumption is implied by exponential pipe hypothesis. Yeah, so this is well justified from uh, various other sources um in uh, in the classic complexity theory. Yep. Just for the reference about this hierarchy, this in if you want to think about analogs in classic complexity uh, theory to those classes, FPT is sort of an equivalent or analog of P. Now all this hierarchy up to WP, this is NP and sort of AW star is and parameters analog of P space, roughly. 
So the interesting thing what happens in parameter complexity is that the analog of NP is not really one class, it is stratified according to the uh, sort of um, power of the verifier, roughly speaking. But let's not go into the details here. I will not speak much about complexity theory behind parameter complexity. For the purpose of uh, designing algorithm, it is important to know that click is complete for W1. So therefore you can prove that your favorite problem is probably not FPT by making a reduction from click. Okay, making a reduction. Speaking about reductions, I said completeness, I had complexity theory. Whenever you're speaking about complexity theory, you need to have a sound notion of reduction. Right? So you need to, uh, if you want to define a reduction, uh, a notion of reduction that will be tailored to this notion of fixed parameter, fixed parameter tractability, you need to have a notion of reduction that preserves being fixed parameter tractable. Yeah? So what you want is a notion of reduction that if you can take uh, your favorite problem L and reduce it to your favorite problem K, and then you can solve K in FPT time, then by combining the reduction and the algorithm, you can solve L in FPT time. Yeah, this is a basic prerequisite for a sound reduction for this kind of a complexity theory. And this is not the usual polynomial time uh, reduction. This is called parameterized reduction. So the idea is that the running time of the reduction can be FPT. So some F of K times and to some fixed polynomial. So you can actually pay exponential time in the reduction, just that the exponential factor must be bounded in terms of the parameter, yes? But the output parameter, so say that I take some instance i comma k and I transform it to some equivalent instance j comma l of, problem of this problem, the output parameter l must be bounded by a function of the input. Yeah, so your reduction should first of all have FPT running time and it should also preserve uh, the bound on the parameter. Yeah, because then, uh, then this diagram will hold. Yes, uh, if you start from this instance and uh, you, you transform into this, if the, the parameter here is bounded by a function of the input parameter, then this function in this running time will, of this parameter will be actually also a computable function of parameter from the beginning. Yes. So this is a notion of reduction that, uh, that is used in parameter complexity. In 99% of reductions, actually they work in polynomial time, but this is important to understand that, um, that the parameter should be preserved. And this is not really surprising. Yeah? And if you work with reductions, say in approximation theory, they should preserve the gap or they should preserve approximate solution size. Yes? In here, they should preserve simply the parameter. Yeah? Um, good. So this is a bit about reductions, and now we can uh, go further with some more examples of problems. So basically, now uh, for the remainder of this uh, of this talk, I will show you some uh, nice examples of uh, of uh, uh, parameterized algorithm, FPT algorithm, using this idea of branching that we had in the beginning, and at the end we will also see some uh, some idea that will be connected closely to. Uh, to integer linear program. Good. So first of all, let's try to take this uh, this branching algorithm uh, with running time to the k and do something better. Yeah. So uh, let me do some uh, tiny reductions in the graph. So uh, simplifications. So now we are working with the vertex cover problem, and we want to achieve some running time slightly better than to the k times times linear. So first of all. If I encounter a vertex U of degree zero in my graph, then definitely it doesn't play any role. I can just delete it. Yeah. If I encounter a vertex U of degree one, then I can make a greedy step. Yes, I can. Uh, definitely, it doesn't make sense to take him because I could take his neighbor instead. Yes. So what I do, I delete the neighbor. Yes. And the decrease 
k by one. Yeah, because I pick him into the solution. And you can also make a reduction when you see a vertex of degree two. Because the idea is that if you see such a situation, you can understand that the, this sort of part of the graph has the following functionality. Either I pick this guy and I do not cover all these edges and I pay one, or I need to, uh, or I do not pick this guy and then I need to pick both of them to cover those edges and then I cover all of those. So if I just squashed all this part of the graph into a single vertex and subtract one from K, I get an equivalent instance because this has the same functionality. Either I pay one and cover everything or I pay zero and do not cover none. Yeah, so I can make a reduction like that as well. Yeah, so in this way, I can apply those rules exhaustively and get that the minimum degree is at least three. Right? So now I can do better branching. Because if I have a vertex U of degree three or more, yes, I can do the following branching. Either uh, do not take U, yeah, so I just uh, remove this vertex from the graph. It is, uh, uh, sorry, uh, I, I actually take U. Either I take U, yeah. So I just remove it from the graph. I remove, uh, I decrease uh, uh, K by one and I remove all those edges instant because they got covered. Or if I decide not to take U, then similarly, as I said here, I need to take all its neighbors, right? So I have here that I can take the neighborhood of U. And now this is a big gain because suddenly we decrease k by three instead of one. Yeah. So in one branch, k decreases by one, in the other, it decreases by three. So now if I write the recursion for the number of leaves of this recursion tree, yes. So here I've got a branch minus one, and here I've got a branch minus three. Yes. And here I've got the subtree. And hopefully this subtree will be smaller because the parameter got, got better. If I write a recursion on the number of leaves, I have the recursion like that. K minus one plus T of K minus three. Yep. Now you can solve it and realize that T of K, I think you get 1.44. Yeah. So now this is the number of leaves that you have in your branching recursion tree. So up to polynomial factor, also the number of total the total number of nodes in your recursion tree. Yes, in each you spend linear time. So you get runtime 1.44 times n plus m, well, to the power k order of. Yeah. So, yes, yeah, so you can play this game uh, of um, like uh, looking at larger and larger situations about vertices, doing some reductions doing clever branching rules and so on and so on. People did this, uh, they got up to 1.2 something something. Um, it's a game that is fun, but a game that ultimately has a limited motivation, at least in my opinion. Uh, so yes, uh, yeah, this is, this is one thing that you can do with, with parameter calculus. But let's see some other examples where doing, uh, making even a, starting branching uh, strategy is not so trivial in the first place. So Can the I next problem something? is Peter. one of the most favorite problems that we have in parameterized complexity, sorry. Uh, it is wet enough. Namely the feedback vertex problem. So in the feedback vertex of problem, you are given a graph and you want to make it a cycle. You want to kill all the cycles by deleting, uh, by deleting vertices. So formally, uh, so feedback vertex set Yes, in this problem we are given 
a graph G and a parameter K, again, a solution size. Uh, and the question is, is there a subset of vertices X of size K such that G minus X is a forest? Um, right, so for example, in, in the graph that we were looking at, the fish graph, probably this would be a feedback vertex of size one, because if I delete it, I suddenly do not see anything. Yes. Uh, can I ask you a question, Iran? Sure. So is there, I mean, you said that you can play this game for vertex cover so that you have smaller and smaller constants to the power of k. Mm -hmm. Is there is there a theory uh, that says there should be an epsilon larger zero such that you cannot go below one plus epsilon to the k? Yes. So um, the theory is exponential time hypothesis. Mm -hmm. So exponential time hypothesis assumes that this happens for such that there is a constant that you cannot get better than uh, than c power uh, n. And uh, by a reduction from this assumption, there is also C larger than one, where the subject you cannot go below C to power K for vertex cover. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, I should have mentioned this probably. Thank you. Good. So feedback vertex at problem, making a graph acyclic by removing at most K vertex. So this is a problem where like a branching strategy is not obvious at the first place because the obstacle is a, lar is a cycle. A cycle can be long. I can hit it by hitting any of the n vertices there, and uh, the, the branching factor of this recursion will be too large for getting an FPT algorithm. Yeah? So the branching strategy is not obvious in the first place. So this problem is fixed branch retractable, and this is one of our favorite examples because essentially you can attack it using any technique from parameters complexity, and you will get a different FPT algorithm. Uh, and it is always a bit non-trivial. So it is a good example to, 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 to see different tools. So here we are going to do branching. But before we do branching, we will actually make similar simplifications as there. Yeah, so this uh, preliminary simplification is something that in the branching algorithm is, is, is often, is often uh, done. So the simplifications that we will do given an instance of feedback vertex that are similar, yeah? If I have a degree zero vertex, I can just delete it. Yeah, it doesn't play any role. If I have a degree one vertex, I can also delete it. It doesn't participate in any cycles. So it doesn't play any, it doesn't make any sense to, to take it in the, in the feedback vertex set. And also I can get rid of vertices of degree two because well, this vertex can be on a cycle but it always pays off to kill one of his neighbors. That's because in this way, I kill all the cycles passing through this vertex and maybe something. Yeah? There's again a question. Yes. Yeah, so my question is that, what are the characteristics which are shown by a problem which is FPT tractable, contrary to those which are FPT intractable? Uh, what are the characteristics? I think uh, if the question is, if you give me a problem, will I be able to say immediately whether it's FPT or not? Well, definitely not. not. In the sense, uh, uh, very often FPT problems are, the, the reason why there are FPT is very intricate and you need to actually really understand the problem and its combinatorics to see why there are FPT. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So there are very many different techniques in this area. And actually this is a good uh, historical comment. When uh, uh, Mike follows and, uh, um, sorry, Rod Downey, yeah, uh, sorry, uh, thank you. Um, discover like a uh, develop this theory in the nineties. Uh, they were mostly concerned about the complexity theory. And in the hint side, they said, there are many more FPT problems than we, than we expected them to, there to be. Yeah, so this theory is much richer than you expect it to be. Uh, namely, many more problems are actually fixed parameter tractable than uh, at the first glance uh, could, uh, could, uh, could be imagined. Okay, so degree to vertex doesn't make sense to kill it. Yes, it makes sense to kill any of its neighbors and therefore I can just bypass it. Yes, I can replace it by energy. 
Yeah? Observe that if I do this reduction, do this simplification, I may end up with a uh, with a multigraph. Yeah, this will not be a problem. Good. So these are simplifications. So again, we ended up with a graph of minimum degree three. So now exhaustive application. reduces the situation to that, that the min deck of G is at least, right? So now let's think about it. So what does it mean minimum degree at least? How many edges there are in the graph? Well, at least three over two times N, times the number of vertices. Yeah, because every edge brings three edges, uh, every vertex brings three edges, at least. Edges are double counted, so I've got uh, at least three over two uh, times N edges. Yeah. But after removing K vertices from the feedback vertex set, I need to get a forest, right? So by removing at most K vertices, I need to bring M, the number of edges, to below N. So this means that I need to really sparsify the graph. Feedback vertex set at some point after this reduction is really a question about sparsification. Yeah, so I'd better hit a high degree vertex in order to sparsify the graph to get rid of all those edges. Yeah, so that's the intuition, and this intuition uh, can be made formal for the following lemma. Yeah, so suppose G is a graph and the min degree, minimum degree of G is uh, at least three. Yeah, and so then. Uh, let's say that S are the 10K highest degree vertices. Yeah. So I just order the vertices by degree, degrees. I take the first 10K ones, yeah. breaking the ties are Then every feedback vertex set of size at most K intersects S. Yeah, so now I have 10k vertices, and I know that if there is a solution, then the solution will actually intersect this set. Yeah, so if I now have this lemma, observe that I immediately have an FPT algorithm because what I will the, then do is perform simplifications. first and then branch on which to take from S. Yeah, so then I forgot 10K candidates. I branch which one I take and I have branching factor uh, 10K. Yes, I branch into 10K options. So then the whole recursion tree has size 10k to the power k, yeah, because I've got branching 10k and depth k, yes, which means that the whole runtime is 10k to the k times linear. You can implement it in linear, right? That's a simplification. Good. So now we are left with proving the lemma, yeah. Okay, so let's draw the situation. So the proof it goes like, so here are the vertices. The vertices, they are ordered by their degrees. So that S, those 10K vertices are here. Yeah, so the size of S is 10K. I can imagine this as split into 10 buckets of K vertices. So by contradiction, suppose that there is some feedback vertex set that takes those vertices. So nothing from S. 
Yes? And the size of the feedback vertex that is a small scale. Right? So how many edges can be deleted from the graph by deleting X? Yes? So the number of edges incident to X, well, it is bounded definitely by the sum of degrees in X. Right? I can even double count some edges here, but definitely it's like this will be. Okay, but the sum of the degrees of the guys in X, the sum of their degrees, the font will be smaller or equal than the sum of degrees in the first bucket. Yeah, because this were the 10K, the K highest degree vertices. And this were the next ones, they will be also higher than the those guys and so on. Yeah, so I can now bound that this is bounded by one over 10 times the sum of degrees in S. Yeah, because each of these buckets dominates those guys. Okay, now this sum I can just write as the sum over all the vertices. Definitely, I'm overpaying much here. Yeah, but the sum of all the vertices uh, of, of the degrees of all the vertices this is just a twice the number of edges. Yeah, so this is the number of edges over five. Yeah, so by deleting edges to incident to X, I have just proved that I can delete at most one fifth of all the edges in the graph. So this means how many edges will remain in the graph? So the number of edges in G minus X, yes, well, it is at least. 80% uh, of the original number of edges because of this, yes. Now the original number of edges, as we have argued uh, somewhere there, is uh, at least three over two times the number of vertices. And magic, this is six over five times n, right? So even if I deleted some vertices, I am still having more edges than I had vertices in the beginning. Yes, so this is a contradiction. And this proves the other. Yeah. So really, we now got a nice FPT algorithm for feedback vertex set, and this really required some graph theoretic understanding and some intuition why a branching high degree vertices should lead us to the solution. And this is a typical situation in FPT algorithms. You really need to understand the combinatorics of the problem to see where to nicely branch. Good. Good, so this was, uh, this was uh, it for the feedback vertex set. We will see this problem probably uh, later on during this, uh, during this uh, uh, school, but in the remaining 15 or 20 minutes or so, I just want to show you one nice connection of, uh, of those uh, branching algorithms with uh, linear programs. Yes. Ah, yes, thank you. I'm not uh, really used to blackboards anymore. There are whiteboards everywhere nowadays. So. Uh, yes. Uh, so. Good question, actually. Uh, Michal? Yes? Yeah, you repeat, make sure to repeat the questions for the people online. Ah, yes. Uh, so the question uh, was, uh, do I really need to go through the simplifications? Because the simplifications seem not to change the degrees of the graphs of the, of the, of the vertices. And at the end, I just cared about the 10K uh, highest degree vertices. Uh, so the fun thing, it would affect the analysis here. Uh, I think that uh, the second rule, right? It can affect the, the degree of this vertex. Yes. So when you d delete a vertex of degree one, you change the degree of the other vertex. So you don't want to uh, uh, um, mess this, this whole analysis by seeing some fake high degree vertex because it has a lot of content vertices. Yeah. Good, but uh, yeah, that's a good observation. So in the remaining time, what I want to uh, talk about is about vertex cover. 
above the LP. So the intuition is that in parameterized complexity, we really want to uh, talk about uh, parameters that say in practice are low. Yes. In vertex cover, probably the solution size will be a really bad parameter for practice because typical like vertex cover of a reasonable graph has size like and half or something like that on the, or an over four in the in the best situation. So we want to find some uh, parameters that are typically much lower for vertex cover and try to design FPT algorithm for them. So one nice interesting uh, choice of a parameterization is uh, the parameterization above LP. Yes, yeah, so we've got a uh, vertex cover instance and we can, can write an LP relaxation. So LP for vertex cover, well, this is the usual LP. So you've got a, uh, a variable XU for every vertex of the graph. This variable is supposed to be taken from zero one, let's say, yes. And for every edge UV in the graph, you write a constraint that x u plus x v uh, is at least one. Yeah, to say that uh, this edge must be in the IP. This would correspond to either this or this being evaluated to one, so the edge being covered. Yes, and then uh, the optimization goal is that you want to minimize the sum of x u's. Yeah. So now you have this uh, this relaxation. Yes, and of course, as usual in in LP relaxations, the optimum integer solution is at least as large as the optimum LP solution. Yeah. So if you are given an instance of vertex cover and you have some parameter K, you'd better have that K is, at the, is larger or equal than the uh, optimum value of LP relaxation, uh, because otherwise you can immediately say, no, there is no solution. Yeah, even the relaxation is not. So now why not to parameterize by this excess, K minus LP, how much over the LP relaxation you are allowed to pay for the, yeah. So typically this parameter will be much smaller than K, yeah, because the LP relaxations will be hopefully quite close to, to, to optimum integral one. So this will, uh, I think even in practice, we checked some some instances and this, this tends to be to be really small. So let's make a uh, sanity check. What happens if K minus LP is equal to zero? So my budget is exactly equal to the uh, optimum of the LP solution. Yeah? Then I can solve the instance in polynomial time. Yeah, Because I look at this LP, I look at the first variable, I try to force it to zero, I try to force it to one and check if the LP went up. Yes, and uh, in one of the choices, uh, in one of the choices, it, it should not go up, and then I can fix this variable and continue and continue and continue. And if it, at, at, at any point I discover a variable such that forcing it to zero or forcing it to one uh, is uh, makes the LP go up, then I see that there is no IP solution uh, with uh, with uh, uh, with uh, cost equal to the LP solution. Yes, so this I can do in polynomial time. Yeah. Okay, good. So this is a reasonable parameterization. One can expect actually some nice parameterized algorithm for this parameterization. Yeah. So now my goal for the remainder of today's talk is to show you an algorithm that solves vertex cover in running time four to K minus LP times polynomial. Yeah. So this will be our current target. And the main tool that we are going to use is that LP for feedback for vertex cover is a very special LP. In the sense it is very simple and it has a lot of nice combinatorial uh, properties. And the main property that we will use is that this LP is half integral. Uh, which means so the fact number 1 uh, Mira can I ask you a question yes uh, I, I i must admit i didn't understand uh, this uh, k minus lp 0 
so you said uh, if if what happens if in both cases zero or one the LP doesn't go up, and what's so well, special? If the LP doesn't go up, yeah, in both cases, uh, is that possible? This is possible. Can't you fix then the variable to either zero or one and continue? Maybe, but I don't see it. Okay, maybe I got that's a, to think that's about That's a it. good point, actually. Okay, maybe we can, uh, I will present the algorithm, that FPT algorithm, and then we will see how it actually plays out. Thank you. And the algorithm. Maybe I was too quick indeed uh, with that. Good, but anyway. Okay, so uh, the lemma I'm going to prove now is that there is always an optimum solution that um, that has values in zero, one half and one. So there is always an optimum solution of this LP relaxation that only assigns uh, value zero, one, and one half. Yeah, this is a special, very special property of this particular. Okay, so let me prove it. So uh, say that X star, this is uh, optimum solution of LP. Yeah, so there's some assignment of weights between zero and one to the vertices of the graph. Yeah. So let me now partition the graph according to uh, how are those weights. So first on the top, I will put the vertices with weights smaller than one half. Yeah. Here, I will put the vertices with weight larger than one half. And here I will put vertices of weight exactly one. So this order will become clear in the moment why, why I put them in this order. I will call them I, H, and B. And uh, this is, I guess, a tradition of parent-rest complexity to name them like that. Okay, so what are the observations I have? So the observation one is that I is independent. I do not have any edges inside I. Well, because both of the endpoints, yes, have weight smaller than one half. So I could not have this constraint there satisfied, this green constraint there. Yeah. So definitely I do not have edges inside here. And similarly, I do not have no edges between I and B. Yeah, because here again, an edge here would sum up to less than one. Yeah, so how the edges actually look like, here are some vertices, there might be edges in here between H and I. There might be edges inside H, there might be edges here, and there might be edges in B. Yeah, these edges are tight, these edges are not tight. Yes? And also those edges are not tight with respect to the uh, with respect to the constraints. So now comes the main observation. For observation three, there is a matching from H to I saturating H. So to see it on the picture, I can here I've got some vertices in H and I claim that I can find a matching between H and I that matches all the vertices of H. Okay, that's a non-trivial statement. So let's prove it. 
So suppose not, there is no such matching. And now we use Hall's theorem between here and here in the bipartite graph between I and H. What does it mean that I cannot match H to I? This means that I can find, uh, maybe the flag, that I can find here in H, I can find some subset of vertices X whose neighborhood in I is strictly smaller. Yes, by Hall's theorem, this is a necessary condition for the non-existence of a matching like that, right? But let's think about LP now, yes? Here I've got say five vertices, here I've got four vertices, and here, the weights assigned by the LP are simply larger than one. So imagine that I pick some very small delta and on X, I do, I decrease the weight slightly by this very small delta and on N of X, I increased by delta. So what happens with the edges? with the constraints. So the constraints between here, nothing happens between them. Yeah, because on every edge here, the total weight is the same. Yeah, one goes up by delta, second goes down, yes? The edges, the other edges between H and I uh, are not affected because these were all the neighbors of X, yes? On the other hand, the constraints inside X were not, uh, inside H were not tight, yeah? Because here we've got, weights larger than one half, so I decrease it by, by tiny delta, they will still be above one. And the same goes for the constraints between H and B, yeah? So no constraint got violated, but this means that the total weight decreased, yes? So this is a contradiction with optimality. Right? Good. Good, so we, now we have this matching, yeah? So now you see that, well, these are those edges. Here I've got those edges. I've got them as many as the size of H. So LP, any, uh, any solution to the, to the linear program would need to, uh, pay at least the size of this matching. So at least the size of this H, yes, for vertices inside H and I, yeah? So the observation is every LP, LP solution needs to pay at least the size of H on H union I, because there is a matching witnessing. Yes, but then I can just put one on H and zero on I. I can modify my solution X star by just putting ones here and zeros there. Yes, and this will be okay. Yeah, I will just make some constraints maybe between H and B even more satisfying. Yes. And in this way, uh, I got a solution that maybe even better than X star, but it's now half integral. So this is proof of the half integrality. And one other, so this is half integrality. Yeah. And the other uh, property that I can get from the same, from the same, uh, from the same reasoning is so-called persistence. And persistence says the following. So if X star is an optimum half integral LP solution, then there is an optimum LP, so, uh, 
integral solution that takes all of how I call that H and none of I. In the sense that you solve the LP half integrally, you got some zeros, you've got some ones. And the lemma says that actually you can make those decisions when solving the, the ILP, the integral. Uh, that you can really do not discard those vertices, they tell that they are not uh, taken and take all those. So those decisions are given by the half integral uh, solution of LP. You can just fix when doing the, the integral part. And the proof is actually there. The integral solution also needs to pick at least as many vertices as the size of H here because of this matching. So I can greedily just pick H because this is the most that I cover. Oh, there is something wrong with the internet. Okay, good. Good, so this is called persistence. Yeah, that solution decisions made by the half integral LP solution are, can be fixed when solving the ILP. And now, based on these two properties, I want to show you this formula for the K minus LP algorithm. Yeah? So, first of all, I can compute uh, optimum half integral. solution. Yes, I can do it uh, either by going through this proof, uh, like uh, taking any optimal solution to the LP using any LP solver and going through this proof and, uh, uh, and doing it algorithmically, or I could do self-reduction. So I solve the LP, uh, and then I look at the first variable. I try to fix it to zero. I try to fix it to one. I try to fix it to, to one half, and I fix the one that doesn't uh, uh, make the, uh, the LP value go up and so on and so on, I fix the consecutive variables. Yeah? And even I can compute some optimum half integral solution that has some zeros or ones, if there is any. Yeah. Let me just uh, say it like that, that uh, I look at the, all, the, all, the, all the vertices and uh, for every vertex, I try whether I can fix a zero or fix a one there, yes? Uh, and then see if the, if the value of the LP goes up. And if so, uh, then, I, then, then I put it there and I, I, I solve the rest uh, half integral, yeah? So, and if I manage to find a half integral solution that doesn't have all the, uh, that doesn't have all one, one half, then this means that I can do simplification. Right? Because the persistence tells me that I can just, on the ones that got a zero or one, I can fix the decision. Yeah? So this means that I am left with the case that all one half is the only optimum half integral solution. Yes, this is the only case that I am left with. Okay. And uh, now, Michal. take any vertex, u and branch, either take u or take the neighborhood. M Micha? Yes. Uh, how do you how do you know that it's the only half integral solution? Like maybe there might be a way to rotate a little bit, and then uh, you know some. So the, idea, so the idea is that uh, uh, I can look at this LP, yes, and I can try. I can take a vertex, and I can try forcing it to zero, or I can try to force it force it to one. Ah, and if the value of the LP doesn't change, then uh, okay, yes. you just keep going. Yeah. I see, I see. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So if I am able to find a, a half integral solution that puts uh, that puts a zero somewhere or a one somewhere, I can do some simplification. I do it and I rerun the whole thing. I see. Yes? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I end up with uh, with all, 
all ones, all all half as the only optimum computer. That's uh, Micha. So that seems yes. to be what what you what what oh, that also clarifies my question that I, that I had in the beginning. Uh huh. Because you you if you if you can set something to zero or to or to one without the change of the LP, then you can do it. Yeah. Cor correct. Yes. All right. Thank you. Good. Okay. So. So what? So then I claim that if I arrive at the simplified situation and I just branch on any vertex, actually I make a good progress in my uh, in my in my in my in solving this uh, this uh, this problem. So the lemma formally, and this hopefully will be the last lemma is that in both branches, this value, value k minus LP, so the gap between k and LP decreases by at least half. Yeah, and this is perfect because this is progress for, an, for our algorithm, yes? If I branch always in two cases, and in each case, I decrease the my potential, my measure of hardness by half. Yes. Then in total, I've got uh, depth twice this. Yes, and branching two, which is exactly for the K minus LP I promised you in the beginning. Yeah. So the proof goes like that, and the proof is actually very easy. So imagine the first, uh, the, the easy case where uh, U is taken. Yeah, so u is taken, so I decrease k by one, yes? And I remove it from the graph and I remove it also from LP. So what happens with the LP? So you can imagine this as a, what happens with the LP, you can imagine this as a two step process. First, I force this variable to one. Yeah, I put a constraint that this variable needs to be equal to one, yes? And then I remove it and remove the cost that it is contributing. So the LP, in the first step, when I'm forcing u to be equal to one, it needs to go, go up by at least half and then goes down by one. Uh, the k decreases by one. Yeah, why it goes up by one half? Well, the LP is half integral, yes? And I knew that the only optimum LP solution is the one that assigns all one half. So if I force something to, to be equal to one, the LP needs to go up and it needs to go up by at least one half because it is half integral. Yeah. And then when I when I remove this, this variable force to one and all constraints that it participates in, the LP value goes down by one because it's not contributing anymore. Yeah. So you see that K goes down by one. And LP goes down by one, but it is bumped by one half before. So the gap decreases by half. Yep, that's the trick. And uh, so this was the case when U is taken. And when N of U is taken, it's the same story. So K decreases by the size of the neighborhood, yes? And what happens with the LP? Again, it goes up by at least half when I'm forcing the vertex to be zero and all its neighbors to be ones. Yes. And then it goes down by the size of the neighborhood when I'm deleting those variables that were set to ones. Yeah. So again, in this case, uh, the gap decreases by one half. And this is because I got into the super strict situation where uh, I have this tightness, the only solution is all one half. So forcing anything needs to bump the LP. Good. So this was the proof. And this essentially finishes the technical part I wanted to, talk, to speak about today. Uh, so this is called LP guided branching. Uh, and this is a, uh, the first example of this kind. Uh, actually, we don't have that many examples of where this kind of technique works. Uh, another example, because we need very special properties of the LP. We need the half integrality and we need the persistence. 
there is one more problem that, uh, that I wanted to say, uh, that I wanted to tell you about where the same happens. And this is multi-way cut, node multi-way cut. You get a graph and there, are, there is a bunch of terminals inside. And you want to delete K vertices in order to separate the terminals from each other. Yeah. So if you write an LP for that problem, so for like there is a variable for every vertex, which is zero one, and for every path between two different terminals, uh, the sum of weights might, might, must be at least one. This, this LP also is half integral and also has persistence. Yes. So then you've got again four to k minus LP uh, times poly n algorithm, which actually is also two to the k times poly n algorithm because LP must be at least uh, k half because it's half integral. And actually, for this problem, this is the best what we know. Uh, so improving upon this algorithm is actually a good, a good open. Uh, there is one more uh, very nice line of work that kind of continues this one, uh, made by Magnus Wallström a few years ago, uh, where he considered other problems where the natural LPs are not half integral. But uh, the trick was that he was not using really LP relaxation. So he was taking a problem that was NP hard and relaxing it to some variant of uh, valued CSPs, uh, where he was forcing somehow half integrality. Yes, so he got half integrality and persistence by the way he designed the relaxation. And then from CSP magic, uh, actually this was polynomial times on top. This is valued CSP. So this is also, I want to highlight that there is a line of work going into this direction, but uh, trying to extend this line of work uh, of this LP guided branching uh, uh, is, is, uh, would, be, would, be, would be very nice. Just one last comment. So we got, here four to uh, k minus LP, but actually for vertex cover, you can get as low as I think 2.316, something, something to the k minus LP times poly n, doing essentially similar tricks as we did in the beginning. Namely, you look at these two options and here you only benefit one half, one half. But if you stare at the situation a little bit more closely, you can squeeze a little bit more from this case. You can get a slightly larger bump in here so that you get a better rotation. And this is a work of Lokstanov and others from, I think, 2003. Good. Sorry for being slightly longer than, uh, than expected, but I hope you appreciated it. This was branching tomorrow. We are going with further techniques. Kernelization and color coding uh, will be tomorrow. Uh, sorry, on Wednesday. Tomorrow uh, is a skip in this series of lectures.